We have Dr. Uh, Deng Vu up next. Uh, he's an associate professor at Concordia University in Montreal, where he currently holds the University Research Chair in Sleep, Neuroimaging, and Cognitive Health. He is also an attending neurologist and the associate director for clinical research at the Institute, uh, wow, um, this is French. Uh, I don't speak French. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's in Montreal. Uh, a clinical assistant professor at neuroscience at the University of Montreal and adjunct professor of neurology and neurosurgery at McGill University. His research is focused in part on the pathophysiology of sleep disorders using multimodal neuroimaging and EEG. If none of these technical terms make sense to you, or if you can pronounce them, uh, at the moment, don't worry, because he is here to tell us what they mean and show us what the future will look like for imaging research on hy hypersomnias. So thank you for being here with us, and it's a pleasure to see you again. Good morning, good morning everyone. Can you hear me well? Yeah? So uh, good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be here, and thank you, David, for these very kind words. And uh, really want to start with thanking the the members of the board of the Hypersomnia Foundation for inviting me once again to talk to you at uh, this uh, annual conference. Very happy to be here in Charlotte. Um, so uh, as uh, David said, I'm, I'm, I've been working on uh, brain imaging of sleep problems, sleep disturbances for a while now, um, for the past 15 years. And I've gained interest in new imaging of central disorders of hypersomnolence and including uh, idiopathic hypersomnia for the past few years. Um, today, what I'm going to do is to uh, introduce you to a, a very new initiative that we launched this year, which is an international consortium of, on an imaging of uh, hypersomnolence uh, that we uh, named Nishi. Um, and you see the, the logo over there. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do first is basically first trying to explain to you why we do need uh, brain imaging in this field, uh, how it works. Uh, what we know about brain imaging of IH uh, in brief, and then what else we need to know. And finally, this will make you understand uh, why there's a need uh, of a consortium and how it works. Okay, so, okay. so why new imaging? Um, I believe that this morning you've had a, a, a few nice talks about uh, the limitation of our current diagnostic tests in um, in identifying patients with idiopathic hypersomnia. We know that MSLT is limited in terms of uh, being able to differentiate between narcolepsy type 2 and IH because uh, so there's uh, some overlap uh, with some patients with NT2 and because we do need, bio, we do need more biomarkers uh, at the moment and you might be aware also of these discussions about we classifying the different disorders of hypersomnolence, which are right now differentiated between narcolepsy type 1, type 2, and idiopathic hypersomnia. And there is a discussion of reclassifying them uh, by, uh, based on clinical criteria and merging some part of the IH um, spectrum with narcolepsy type 2 and keeping IH for those with long sleep time. So I think these are all very important initiatives. Um, what we, need to, uh, what we need to provide to support these initiatives is uh, to find ways to differentiate them at the biological level at the, at the, in terms of mechanisms uh, and in terms of biomarkers because these are all based on clinical criteria and we don't know whether this reflects different mechanisms or not. So um, this is why new imaging uh, is important because new imaging offers a way to identify both mechanisms in the brain in these disorders, and also to offer possibility to identify biomarkers for disorders, including IH and narcolepsy, which might help with the diagnosis and the reclassification of those diseases based on mechanisms. And brain imaging techniques nowadays are safe, they're painless, they do not require um, any collection of samples, biological samples, so for patients it's comfortable. It does, it costs a certain price, but it does not, uh, it's not uh, painful for patients. So I think it's, it's a very important uh, tool that we still have in our pipeline. So, um, so, so that's why we do need new imaging in this field. Um, and now just a few words about how it works. 
Um, there's different, there's a variety of uh, methodologies and, and modalities of Im brain imaging or imaging in general. One of the most commonly used is uh, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, that you're probably familiar with. Maybe some of you had had an MRI before. Uh, so with MRI, um, what you can do is to, you're, you can characterize different aspects of the brain. You can, you can study the uh, structure, the anatomy of the brain by looking at uh, how the, how the um, uh, by looking at the shape of the surface of the brain, the volume of certain structures in the brain, and you can also look at uh, the, what we call the tracts, so the connections between different areas of the brain uh, with uh, what we call uh, diffusion tensor imaging, for example. Uh, but you can also look at brain function, and there's different ways to look at it, but the most common way is to use what we call functional MRI or fMRI, where you can look at um, some uh, measurements reflecting brain functions either during rest doing different tasks, for example, while people are seeing objects, pictures, faces, or doing some memory tasks. And we can also look at what happens during sleep uh, while uh, people are sleeping in a scanner. So that's something we've actually, my lab has been specializing in uh, for, for the past decade. So there's different ways you can um, look at the brain uh, with MRI. And um, just a quick word, uh, I presented those data already, but I want to um, maybe do a quick recap about what we know uh, at the moment about brain imaging in patients with IH and also narcolepsy. Um, we did publish that a couple of years ago, where we showed that when you look at brain function um, of patients with IH, we can look at it in different ways, but we can look uh, at what we call functional connectivity. It means how different regions of the brain communicate with each other, okay? And so by looking at that, we can look at the strength of these connections uh, between patients with IH and people who have uh, no sleep problems. And what we found is that there seems to be some um, uh, altered uh, dialogue between uh, regions that belong to what we called the default mode network, DMN, which, are, which is a network of the brain, you can see it in, in red on the right side, which is involved in a variety of functions, but notably in uh, maintaining the brain alert and, and, and vigilant, and, and so supporting different uh, internal con uh, cognitive functions. So and we know that uh, this, uh, so this function of this network can also be uh, linked to alteration of consciousness. So we think that um, this brain is important for um, the modulation of vigilance. And what we observe is that uh, patients with idiopathic hypersomnia do have a decreased dialogue between regions of this network, particularly at the front, the uh, lower part of the brain. You can see that on the left side. And this sort of uh, breakdown in connections, in dialogue between regions of the brain might uh, contribute to the reason why patients with hypersomnia are less able to maintain, to remain vigilant and alert during the day. And we, also, we actually observed that the more um, patient was sleepy, as measured by the Epworth sleepiness scale, the less uh, communication there was between uh, some of the regions of this default mode network. So really it shows that you know, the dialogue between different regions of the brain is important, and there seems to be a disruption of this dialogue in patients with hypersomnia, okay? Um, so that's what we showed some time ago. And I said that we also uh, can look at the anatomy of the brain, and we looked at how um, the volumes or the thickness of different regions of the brain was different in patients with IH and, patient, and, and, and people with, without IH. And what we observe is, is once again, this uh, so-called default mode network of the brain seems to be affected in, in a way that uh, regions of this network are increased in terms of thickness in patients with IH. So you would say, why is that the case? So we don't really know, but one possibility is that because, as I said earlier, there's uh, some uh, disrupted communication between regions of this, uh, of this uh, network, there might be some sort of compensation that builds up over the years what the brain is trying to compensate for this lack of communication dialogue by increasing 
uh, thickness increasing uh, local structure in soil to in a way to compensate for this. And that's what we observe. This there's a greater thickness of the brain regions within this network in patients with IH. So these are this is uh, not sure what we know right now about the imaging of IH. There's a couple of other studies, but not many that are so in the same line of thought. Um, and I quickly want to show you, uh, to show you by contrast, what we know about, uh, about the imaging of narcolepsy with cataplexy or type 1. What we know is that the, 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 uh, the, uh, the disruptions in terms of function and structure are much different. They are much broader. In patients with narcolepsy type 1, we've observed that the, uh, the thickness, uh, the volumes in different areas of the brain is decreased, but in, more, in a lot more regions than in patients with IH. And if you look at brain functions, that's also the case. We observed and different studies, not only us, uh, when we looked at uh, different studies that were conducted over the past 15 years, these studies usually converge in showing that uh, different regions of the brain are also less active uh, during wake. And um, so that's a very different pattern. I showed you that in IH, this seems to be localized in this default mode network. In patients with narcolepsy type 1, this seems to be more widespread, more distributed across the brain. Uh, and particularly, uh, you'd notice that the hypothalamus is affected. And the hypothalamus, which is the structure at the base of the brain, is involved in the production of hypocretin, which is involved in narcolepsy type 1. And this, uh, hyper this hypocretin projects to a lot of regions of the brain. So we thought that with one, one thought is that these patterns show the disruptions in the hypocretin system in patients uh, with narcolepsy type 1. And, and finally, in patients with narcolepsy type 2, there's barely, there's very limited number of studies. There's uh, not even a handful, one or two studies. But what this seems to show is that the changes in the brain of the patient with narcolepsy type 1 are much more limited so on the, uh, than type uh, type 2 are more limited than type 1. You see there on the left side the changes in glucose brain metabolism in type 1 narcolepsy. On the right, uh, what happens in type 2 narcolepsy, you see that the, uh, the colors are much less uh, uh, apparent. Uh, so the regions of the brain that are affected are much uh, more limited. So, so uh, that's the only thing we know right now. So, but we definitely need more studies. So in summary, what we know about new imaging of IH on narcolepsy is that in IH there seems to be this, uh, these anatomical and functional changes in the brain in this region of what we call the default mode network. Narcolepsy type 1, the change seems to be much more uh, distributed, widespread, including uh, regions involved in the hypocretin system. And in narcolepsy type 2, there's very limited changes. So, um, what else do we need to know? Um, well, we need to know, we, we still have a long way to go because all the studies that I showed you were based on a comparison of one of those types of hypersomnia with um, controls. We, and we, we are yet to know what happens when we compare patients with IH, patients with narcolepsy type 1, patients with narcolepsy type 2, and good sleepers, including those who are uh, sleep deprived. So we, we are yet to know what happens and when we directly compare those patients, because that's what we need in order to find biomarkers that are specific to each condition. We need to compare them in the same study. Okay? So this is yet to be done. We need also to compare different states, because all the studies I showed you were based either on a study of, uh, of the structure of the brain or the function of the brain at rest. So people were just resting and trying to do nothing in the scanner. But for example, what we, very, we have no knowledge about right now is what happens while, in terms of the brain function when patients sleep. And that's very important because, as you know, as you know the very important part of the disease is the fact that there's something going on with sleep, at least transition to sleep or inability to stay awake. So there, there's a sleep component that is very widely unknown in, in, in the study of those disorders right now. Finally, we also need to be able to differentiate what happens in those uh, disorders compared to 
what characterizes in the, uh, the brain of patients who are just somnolent, but because they are sleep deprived, or because they are yeah because they just sleep late, uh, because we need to to differentiate what is related to somnolence, non-specifically compared to what happens in the brain of patients with those disorders. So that's why we also need a comparison with sleep deprivation. Right? So there's, there's still a long way to go, and we need also to recruit larger numbers of people to have more robust findings, because those studies, uh, they're not easy to conduct, um, uh, because we need to recruit patients, we need to also exclude those who are not eligible for a variety of reasons. And so usually those studies are based on a limited number of people. 10, 20, 30 max, uh, which is a very small uh, representation of people with IH or narcolepsy. So uh, we, we've started this, in, this um, initiative for the past uh, three years now, where we do have a study that compares anti-narcolepsy type 1, narcolepsy type 2, idiopathic hypersomnia, and sleep deprivation. And we do have a joint uh, collaboration between uh, my site in Montreal and our colleagues in Netherlands uh, and Leiden, Amsterdam Leiden, where we actually do study the brain of patients with IH and narcolepsy in these two centers. And this study is still ongoing, but I want to show you uh, a glimpse of what, is, uh, sh what our preliminary findings are showing. Uh, and, for example, what we've done as preliminary analysis to look at the volume of the hypothalamus. And you know that uh, I told you that hypothalamus is important because the volumes might be related to the lack or, uh, or not of hypercretin. Um, and what we observe is when you compare the volume of the hypothalamus across the different conditions, you see that um, there is a clear decrease in the volume of those who have narcolepsy type 1 in blue, uh, while those with IH in green and those with narcolepsy type 2 in purple have a level of decrease of the hypothalamic volume that, which is much less consistent okay? uh, and close to what happens in patients in people without sleep problems. So this is an example that, uh, with a measure of brain imaging, you are, might be able to provide, find biomarkers that uh, may distinguish different uh, category of patients, objectively without um, the need to rely only on clinical criteria, and, and, and also reflecting the mechanisms that underlies the condition. Okay? But this is just an example. As I said, we, are, we can study a, a lot more in terms of um, modalities of brain function. So now, why do we need a consortium then? Because we're doing these studies. Well, that's because um, we still need to, um, to have uh, data and findings that are reliable by merging large numbers of data. And even if two sites, we're not able to obtain uh, numbers that are high, as high as maybe 100 or something. So by gathering researchers around the world, uh, we, will, we might be able to obtain more robust findings. Because what, con I don't know if you're familiar with what a consortium is, a consortium is basically gathering people, in this case researchers, uh, around different centers, not only in North America, but also in Europe, in Asia, and in the, or across the world, to, um, to, to, to uh, bring together the data and expertise to, un to address different and specific questions. In this case, to address the questions of finding in brain imaging biomarkers for these disorders. So, um, so by having people from all around the world, we're able to reach much higher numbers of data and have more reliable findings. And I think also importantly, you also need to acknowledge, and that's something that is increasingly recognized in the field, that we need data that are more representative of what happens in patients across, uh, around the world, because we're obviously biased by looking at you know, a very small portion of patients, uh, Canadians, Americans, or Dutch people. And we don't know if that's the case, if uh, the, the, the varieties, the, the, the changes uh, are, the, uh, the findings that we observe can be replicated if you also include patients from Asia, from other parts of Europe. So it's very important to, if you want to advance to the field, to have results that are representative of patients around the world, taking into account the diversity of 
you know, of ethnicities, cultural backgrounds, and so on. Okay. And uh, last but not least, I think it's also important to build bridges between teams and make uh, and, and facilitate collaborations between researchers because, I mean, we have much more potential where we have uh, more brains around the table to actually think about what to do, what to look for, okay? Because it's not only me, it's not only our colleagues. I mean, we have to have uh, some discussion about what people think based on the experience, the knowledge, uh, what would be needed to uh, look for, okay? So um, that's why we launched this new emerging consortium of hypersomnance, Nishi. And over the past few months, we've contacted uh, different sites and different colleagues around the world. And you see here, uh, the, the different dots shows you the, the, the centers that have uh, expressed interest in participating to this consortium. We have formed a, a steering committee, which I co-chair with my colleague, uh, Ace Brian van der Weer from Amsterdam. And we have representatives from um, Europe, from uh, uh, Asia with Dr. Ju from Seoul, uh, from US with Dr. Trolley from uh, here, Atlanta, and um, from Switzerland with Dr. Schwartz from Geneva. And we uh, have, uh, these are all the people that have expressed interest. And you see that we have sites really uh, across the globe from a lot of different countries in Europe, but also from uh, US, obviously, from China. Um, uh, and, and, and so you have, a, you have a much more wider representation of, of the, uh, the, the world. So how does it work, a consortium, in terms of brain imaging? So what we can do is we can address very specific questions, and this is, will be decided by the consortium. But we can, for example, discuss, want to see what, are there some robust changes in, the, in certain volumes of the brain? in patients with IH compared to good sleepers in the same way that what I showed you, but when looking at much larger numbers. And how it would work is that each center would basically process the imaging data based on a pipeline that we will be standardizing across sites. And then all the sites will send their data, the output to a center that will make the analysis. So that's really very, like, uh, very schematically described. But basically, each uh, site would be responsible for processing the imaging data and then show the other, uh, and then we will merge the analysis to find, uh, to find the uh, robust conclusions. And so that's a, that's a potential that I want to show you also. When we gathered the samples across the consortium, we have a potential of reaching uh, more than 500 people with narcolepsy type 1. You see that the numbers for IH and NT2 are still much lower, but still we would, if we, everyone is able to contribute the data, would be close to 100 uh, patients with, uh, with each uh, condition and much more people with, uh, uh, with, uh, with controls with, without sleep problems. So there's really a potential to obtain much larger numbers and numbers that are, and patients that are representative from the world. Uh, so that's really what the consortium will help us with. So uh, now maybe you're gonna ask me how, maybe if you're interested, how you can contribute. Uh, so you, you can still contribute, and ba basically you can contribute by participating to one of the ongoing studies that are collecting data of imaging uh, in one of the sites. And my site is still continuing uh, to collect data. So if you're interested, if you have IH, obviously, or even if you have narcolepsy type 1 and type 2, we have uh, the study going on with MRI. In, uh, so basically the conditions that would need to is that you need to have um, no metal. That's the conditions you undergo an MRI. So, um, uh, and if, if you have a so claustrophobia, it's also not really recommended because you have to stay for quite a long time in the MRI. But uh, the study involves two visits in the sleep lab, one overnight sleep with the naps, and the second visit a couple of days later where you'd have the MRI uh, in the early afternoon. And so the location is in Montreal, uh, Quebec, Canada. We do compensate for participation of your time and we reimburse travel costs, including transportation and accommodation. So if you're interested, feel free to contact us and write us an email, all right? And with that, um, I'll acknowledge all members of my team. This is my team in Montreal. We're quite a large team, and particularly I want to acknowledge people who 
who are actively uh, working on this hypersomnia project, uh, Dr. Pomares, Dr. Cross, um, my students, uh, Yarigo, uh, Jean-Louis Aron, and the technologist and research assistant, Isabetta and Elina, and our collaborators in Netherlands, Dr. Van der Weer, Fronsec, and Lamos. With that, thank you very much for your attention, and happy to address and answer any questions you have. Yes, yes, I actually don't have control over this. <laughs> Ask me. Can you put, I put up the slide that has this contact information? Yeah, it's not the last slide, it's the slide before the last. Yeah, this one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, questions from the floor? Um, as I walk over there, I will tell you I have been a subject in that study in Montreal. It's a lovely city, and I encourage you to go and participate. Thank you very much. Uh, as much as I'd like to go up to Montreal, it sounds like a lot of fun. I, I'm not sure if I can make it, but I have had an MSLT and uh, I've had neuroimaging done on a, and I kept the records for it. Is there any way I could just mail those to you guys and then you put them in your system and tell me how it, how it uh, relates to you know, your current data set? Uh, that's a very important question. So. Um Unfortunately, it's not really possible because in order to be able to provide, to find, to, to conduct the analysis, you need images to be conducted over the same scanner because otherwise we won't, if we find differences, we won't be able to know whether it's due to the different protocol or the scanner or due to actually the, the condition you have because there's a variety of scanners <laughs> available and a variety of different sequences and parameters. It's not like everyone's using the same sequence, unfortunately, uh, we cannot compare um, images that have been conducted over different sites, unless we do, um, unless in, in the consor or we do like in the consortium, but then in the consortium what we do is that we have not one patient, but like 20, 30 patients per site, and then we can include the site uh, differences in the analysis, but we cannot do that with one single scanner, for example, unfortunately. But thank you for Think about that, but that's important. Thing. So we, we cannot uh, just take individual scanners, unfortunately. Hi there. Um, so you showed your populations of people based on narcolepsy type one, type two, hypersomnia, and healthy control. Do you start the study with somebody coming in and saying, hi, I think I'm hypersomnia, please scan my brain? Or do you like, scan people who say, I'm sleepy, and then you say, oh, you seem to be in one of these patterns? Oh, okay, so that's a good question. So what we do is that we, we, we need patients who already have a diagnosis, uh, because as you know, there's, there might be a lot of different causes for hypersomnolence. It could be narcolepsy, it could be um, hypersomnia, because there could be I don't know, a, a problem with your thyroid gland or another different thing. So they need to be a first uh, diagnosis, medical diagnosis. Um, the ones that once done, we do, we do the, uh, the, the, the sleep studies in the labs to just confirm that those findings are still the case, that we do, we do the overnight PSG and the MSLT, but we, do, we, we cannot redo the whole medical assessment. That's what we need to be done by your physician first. Um, if there's anyone else that would like to ask a question, I'm happy to give them the, yes. Um, so we first. have an online question, uh, and the question is, are sleep doctors using uh, this imaging uh, already in the field or you know, in their practices? So is the question about whether it's being used in practice already? Yeah. Uh, okay, so it's, um, it's being used in clinical practice when you want to exclude uh, a secondary type of uh, hypersomnolence, for example, if the doctor suspects that there might be possibility of brain, a brain lesion that explains hypersomnolence, uh, but it's not done either for the purpose of uh, the, the, the research and practice. It's done only in selected cases when you suspect um, that there might be some lesion in the brain. Do you have to wash off all your, or wash out all of the medication for this? For like, what, two weeks beforehand? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So we do, that's just because we, um, we need to be able to, to to uh, assess whether 
the change that due to the condition and not the medication, we do ask patients to stop the stimulant medication 48 hours before. But the, uh, the antidepressants, if they are taken for, for example, for ketoplexy, they need to be stopped two weeks because they have a longer half-life. What about like um, Oxybate? It's one of the yeah, it's the same. We need to have them to be stopped, yeah. Okay, this is just a comment yeah. for, as a patient. Um, we obviously never do this because we want to make money. Like we do it because we want to give information that will help, you mm. know, create better, more productive treatments and um, maybe even <laughs> God help us find a cure. But um, when you, if we are fortunate enough to be able to work, which most of us are not, and I'm not, I'm, I'm disabled, um, washing off your medications, then you, we can't drive. We can't drive to the grocery store to get stuff. Um, it's not necessarily safe if you're not treated mm -hmm. on that. Um, so we have to pay for Ubers or transportation to do our errands unless mm -hmm. we're fortunate enough to have a partner in life who will help us with these things. Yeah. Um, we, if you are fortunate enough to work, you're probably not able to work for those two weeks that you're off of the medication. Mm -hmm. And probably for the next two weeks after the trial, while you re, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, I don't know the word, get back to your, reestablish your, your, your um, schedule and your, and your life. Um, so for those of us who want to participate in research, it's very difficult to manage mm -hmm. participating in research without those things taken care of. And just so, it's just information. So when you apply for grants, maybe <laughs> put that in there um, so that no, that yeah. stuff can be taken care of. Yeah, no, that's a very good comment. I completely understand and acknowledge this difficulty. Um, so um, I do want to point out that you really that's limited for the time that you're doing for the research. Um, and then, and I also want to point out that we, we're trying our best to be to accommodate uh, people in such a way that they uh, tell us what would be a good time for them, um, uh, uh, when it would be easier for their schedule. Um, we try to we try to commit it to the best of our of the poss of our po right. possibilities. But I know that's a limitation. I know it's not easy for patients yeah. to stop their medications. Um, we sometimes have patients who are who are what we call drug naive, so they're just starting to be diagnosed, so they haven't received medications yet. So that would be the ideal time. And most of you are already medicated, so I know that's a difficult bit. It's um it's just difficult to um and it's it's not only I would say it's not limited to hypersomnia. Most of the trials would have medicated people without medications. It's right. a strong limitation for the studies. Um, in the future, once we have more data about what happens without a patient without medication, we could have those studies in patients maybe with medications to to try to have a, a better understanding of what happens uh, in terms of also the effects of medication over time. But we're not there yet. We still need to know what happens. Right. The patients are not medicated. Yeah. I, I fully is, understand. I, mean, it I know it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not that patients don't want to put space, just that sometimes it's this difficult. I fully understand. Uh, the, uh, well, and that's why we are so, that's why we, it's, we, we, we need to have this consortium just to have more people who are able to do this uh, around the globe because obviously. We need people who are able to accommodate their um, commitments, their family commitments, work commitments, and so on. Yeah. Well, and also just a thought, just to put it out there, you know, so for people who suffer with, um, from cataplexy, mm -hmm. uh, you take them off of, you know, the oxybates, take them off of if they're on an antidepressant because it's a rim suppressant. Um, rebound cataplexy is not fun, mm -hmm. and um, it could actually be potentially worse. Mm -hmm. than it was beforehand and longer lasting even when you go back on the medications. There's a lot higher risks for the cataplexy when you go off of especially um, something like Lexapro. Um, yeah. So it's, it's just, it, it's a big ask. <laughs> no, no, I understand. And, yeah. and, um, and so that's just something that I just wanted to communicate so that the uh, sacrifice and risks um, just are understood, I think, better. Mm -hmm. No, fully, fully not that. Thanks for the comment. Sorry, I'm sure I won't get all the medical terms right, but in the earlier slides you showed that for people with IH, they had increased or thickened uh, part of the cortex in here. Would you expect to see that if you did multiple scans over the years of patients with IH, that the cortex would 
thicken over time because the brain is struggling to, you know, make other connections? That's a, an excellent question. So um, obviously we don't know the answer yet, but I would indeed expect that this would be the case. Uh, we do observe those uh, progressive changes in patients with narcolepsy type 1. There's been some studies in uh, Korea that have shown that if you repeat the scans, those changes actually progress and worsen over time. Um, so uh, this might be, it might be the case also in patients with IH, uh, that those changes might be um, increasing with time as well. So we need to, well, that, that would be an, an additional step to do multiple measurements. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ningfu.